one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Aaron, could you please call the roll? Mr. Dupuri? Here. Ms. Hendrickson? Here. Ms. Saunders? Here. Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Bealey? Here. And Ms. Auglis? Thank you. And I'll second. Any discussion? Uh, yes, please. I have two clarifications. One on page four, um, the middle paragraph where it says Miss Saunders. Instead of um, ending the con the, pa the uh, paragraph with the pre-construction <coughs> meeting, I just wanted to say to ensure winter construction has appropriate erosion sedimentation measures included. And then on page seven, I'd also like to add a footnote that says as stormwater management features, just to clarify some of the things that I said, and I'll hand it to Karen. I'll amend the motion to include Ms. Saunders' comments. Right. Second that. Any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Before we move on, one quick housekeeping item. Uh, item number eight, Toughen Up LLC, um, has been tabled uh, to allow a little more time to address some open items there. Uh, the next item, number four, Rosewood Land Development, Inc. requests ske sketch plan review for Tucker Brooks subdivision, Payne Road, map R49, <coughs> lot two. Okay. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as you just noted, this is a sketch plan, and so a sketch plan is an opportunity for an applicant to provide an overview of the project for the board, um, to begin a discussion around sort of uh, the concept of what they're looking to do, um, introduce any of the areas uh, that they want like some further guidance and for the board to um, provide any thoughts they have uh, for the applicant moving forward uh, as noted this is a sketch plan for a subdivision the subdivision is in the R2 district the R2 district requires that um, if the, a site meets certain characteristics one of which is an acre or more of wetlands that it needs to go through a conservation subdivision review process um, this is a little bit unique from what the board might typically expect to see in a conservation subdivision in that um, one of the characteristics in the R2 um, that we want to really start a discussion with the board about is um, that sewer um, sanitary connection is required unless the board finds that it's unreasonable or infeasible um, based on whatever characteristics. And if the board does find that, then the subdivision really defaults back to uh, a, a typical R2 lot size, which is 20,000 square feet with 100 feet of frontage. Um, but 40% of the land area needs to be maintained as open space rather than the typical 50%. So that's a little bit what you'll be hearing about as we move forward. Um, as, a, as staff reviewed this, you've uh, received comments from us. Um, we just want to draw to the board's attention a couple of things. Um, this property uh, backs up to an existing uh, neighborhood called the, um, oh my gosh, it's Heritage Acres. Heritage Acres, thank you. Heritage Acres <coughs> uh, neighborhood where there's known to be a number of issues with uh, existing septic systems. And so just as we move forward, should the board find that sort of connecting to sanitary, uh, to the sewer system is truly infeasible, we'll really want to be sure we fully explore sort of the subsurface wastewater disposal that the applicant will be going through through this process. Um, and let's see, a couple other items we want to just touch on is there's a, a stream that runs through uh, the backside of uh, a few of the lots. I think it's lots one through seven. Um, and just really understanding sort of the setbacks to that stream and, and impacts there. Um, and as always, when we look at these subdivisions in the conservation subdivision design, uh, the purpose is to avoid any disturbance of wetlands unless the board finds that there's really no other feasible or practical alternative. And so um, just being sure we're thinking about those issues. Um, so I think that will be it at this point for my, uh, uh, my overview, and I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Jay. And I'll turn it over to the applicant's representative. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Sean Frank. I'm an engineer with Sebago Technics. 
Uh, with me tonight is uh, Joe Fustacci of uh, Rosewood Land Development. Um, as usual, uh, Jay's done a, a nice introduction, and if I may, I would just uh, walk over to the board and give a, a quick introduction to the project. So, I believe this is on the red light, so I, I hope it's working. Uh, just to get everyone oriented, uh, the project is located at 
there's something comfortable you get working systems in here that uh, uh, function fine. Uh, we would anticipate doing a nitrate analysis for the work uh, and then on that as part of our uh, subdivision application uh, associated with that. Um, what else do I have here? Again, I will go ahead and impacts. Uh, in terms of the open space, uh, there was a question regarding the, the final disposition of that. Uh, the applicant is certainly more willing to, is more than willing to discuss uh, with the town, uh, with the land trust, uh, anybody that might be interested in that. And if not, obviously, then we'll just uh, maintain it as part of the homeowners association uh, that run along with that. Certainly, we will work with uh, with the police and fire department in terms of those things. So. Uh, uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, we understand this is just sketch plan. Uh, appreciate the fact that you know our time has been spent a lot, obviously, in terms of the uh, the natural resources on the site, the passing soils on the site. Uh, so we want to present it to the board before we took the next step and started doing a lot of heavy design associated with this, uh, just to try to get your feedback and any concerns you folks might have before we started that process. So, uh, with that, I conclude my presentation and certainly be happy to answer any questions that the board has. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Roger. Would you like to start off on there? Uh, sure. Um, initially, I I was wondering about the um, you know the debate between sewers and uh, septic system, but um, seeing that Heritage Acres, I, I assume Heritage Acres does not have sewers; they just have septic systems there. And I know they've had a lot of problems over the years, um, so it doesn't seem to me to make a lot of sense to try and demand or mandate that this project have sewers if Heritage Acres, which is upland from where this place is, uh, does not have it. I, I don't know what the backstory with that is. Uh, anything you can enlighten us on? Or? Maybe you could also, uh, Jay or Angela, give a little bit of context in terms of, um, you know, if there is at least kind of a rough rule of thumb for what the town generally considers to be reasonable proximity there was a discussion with the uh, director of the sanitary district at our interdepartment review meeting and you know he, his feeling was that um, and Jamel told me if I go astray here but during that discussion he felt that it was that that was a long distance and that the, the district itself wasn't certainly inclined to sort of move forward with that and that it was you know that it, it was outside of what they would typically expect someone to do um, but you know that's so that that's what we heard from the district um, and I guess I, so I'm sorry Roger I guess I wasn't fully uh, following so right Heritage Acres does not have public sewer everyone's on septic systems there um, and I guess I don't uh, well I, I guess my point is I uh, the neighborhood I live in when <coughs> the sewers went in in the mid 80s mm -hmm. I mean people couldn't wait to hook up to it because it was constantly there was constantly water problems there and um, so I would assume Heritage Acres, the people there would feel the same way. I'm, I was just kind of curious why they haven't hooked up to sewage, you know, um, especially where they've had this history of, of having, uh, you know, problems in that neighborhood. And if they, there's got to be a really compelling reason. It's probably financial or, or maybe, it's, you know, geo, uh, geo, uh, geology. Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, one of the things that our, the, the, the local sanitary district is typically not in the business of expanding their lines. They sort of look to development to do that and then to tie into the existing capacity. So um, I don't know that there has been, at least in my 10 years here, really much discussion on, on sort of the public side in terms of sewer expansions um, sort of without there being new development coming along and sort of being the um, doing the, the heavy lift on that okay so I don't know how the rest of the board would feel but it doesn't seem to make um, from from my point of view regarding that debate I can see where the you know the septic systems makes more economic sense to go that route um, the other question I would have is on on lot eight <coughs> is, is your is your idea that you're going to be having the driveway going from the end of the hammerhead? Not quite the end, on the side. Yeah, on the side. On the side of the hammerhead and up almost along the property line and then swing back into the water. Okay. Is there any? Do we have any problem with with that arrangement? 
Um, so we do have a design and a detail for where driveways can go. Basically, yeah. there's a, it can't be, I think, within 25 feet of the end of the hammerhead or 25 feet from where it radius is where? off the main trunk okay. line. So there is a window in which... Yeah, I think we'd have just enough window to make it. <laughs> Well, so that's a detail that would be flushed yeah. out. Is there a window? It looks like it's right at the end of the hammerhead. Is where it would be. We'd well, have to impact. I'm sorry. You'd have that's to one. impact wetland. It yeah. Looks like in yeah. some respect for light. Okay, so that's uh, that's a question <coughs> for down the road, I guess. Or <laughs> I would think they would need to demonstrate how they thread that needle. Yeah. And whether there will be any wetland impact. And okay. Um, I guess at this point, I, I don't have any, anything further. Thanks. Nick? <clears throat> I'm going to just go back to that sewer for a second. Do, where are the lines kind of stopping in relation on the larger picture here? Let's stand back a little bit. Do we know if roughly maybe. where those sewer lines are? And this is more to satisfy my own curiosity. Yep. So I think, as the uh, as uh, Mr. Frank mentioned, they're up near um, uh, Bonnie Grove, which is up Payne Road. And I'm trying to zoom in it here on the sort of yeah. It's pretty close to Cabela's. Yeah, Very Bonnie close Grove to Cabela's. is the closest yeah. I, I found. Yeah. Yep. And so Bonnie Grove. Let's see. Where are we here? There's Payne. I think this is Haggis Parkway labeled as home route. So probably if you look up at the screen, my mouse is sort of going probably in that area. Over here Payne Road. On, along Payne Road. There's a lot of, a lot of businesses right around. So, yeah, so, so Bonnie Grove is just beyond Cabela's on, on Payne Road. Is that first the subdivision first right. on the right? Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Okay. It's probably a 10 lot or so subdivision. And this actually, is over a quarter mile away. Yeah, and I just did it quick, as I remember right. I, I think I just did it quick on the aerial, and it just came up right around 3,000 feet, as I recollect. Okay. <coughs> um, and then also on the, the larger view of things, and I'm glad you mentioned the sanitary district portion of this, which is they don't really have a whole lot of intent to continue to expand their lines. Um, I just don't want to uh, sell ourselves short here in the sense of, you know, if there was a connection from Route 1 down to Payne Road, it, it seems to me like that would be a natural uh, progression of development in this area. Um, you know, kind of is a busier area. We know there's some land out there. Um, <clears throat> but I also know the hardship that I don't necessarily think that it should be the developer's burden either, so uh, in, a, in its entirety. So a little torn on that one. But if, uh, if you can make it work with the soils and uh, not experience the issues that the, n the neighboring development has. That would, I guess, just satisfy me. Um, and I don't know if I missed your comment on this. I know, I know staff in their comments had mentioned putting lot eight perhaps next to lot seven. Is there any reason that you were not in favor of it other than that you think the current lot eight is a nice spot for a house? Yeah, number one, that is a nice spot for a house. But the main thing is in terms of what I was going to do with the storm. And it looks like uh, lot 11, you tried a couple times to find some good soils. Does that sound right? Yes, lot 11. <laughs> I saw that. Uh, I, and I apologize. Those weren't all passing test pits. Those were just a number of test pits that were there. But you're right. They were the ones in the middle. Actually, are the ones that weren't passing. So, uh, um, you know, there were certainly some, uh, uh, you know, areas that in terms of the soils, again, would probably pass the state, uh, but didn't quite pass the town. I think I'm all set for right now. Thanks, Nick. If I could just make a, a clarifying point, and this is actually an issue that came up on a, on a recent subdivision as well, and just want to be sure that the applicant's thinking about it as they move forward with their stormwater approach, that um, 
area utilized for stormwater facilities doesn't get counted towards the open space oh, you mentioned provision. That, yeah, yep. So I just want to be sure that that gets mentioned and is included in your calculations as you move forward. Um, so that was it. Thanks. Thank you, Jay. You had sent that to me, so I okay. appreciate you re re saying that again. That's for mm -hmm. Robin? Yeah, and along that same line, Jay, I was wondering if you could talk about sort of the intent for a conservation easement. Is it to have contiguous open space that's meant for enjoyment? Is it to, could you just talk a little bit about the intent of the con so, Sure, of the conservation design? subdivision design? Yeah. Uh, so the, the first intent is wetlands avoidance and to, uh, to not impact wetlands. Mm -hmm. um, then the ordinance does spell out uh, it's I think there's three or four ways that you can utilize the open space um, the first one they sort of talk about is just sort of natural areas and it does it looks to try to create contiguous open spaces um, you know uh, for woodland creatures and, and mm -hmm. for um, uh, for all the other values that that, that creates um, uh, open spaces can be used for agricultural land mm -hmm. um, if, if the so, you know if the soils were such that this was a good uh, uh, farmland, which it doesn't sound like it is, um, that, 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 that could be a uh, utility. Um, it does allow for sort of, um, uh, I'll call it more active mm -hmm. uh, uh, recreation space. It doesn't necessarily just have to be trails or wood, but um, again, these are sort of things that the board can approve. Um, uh, so that's another uh, stated intent or allowance, I should say, of the concert, uh, for the open space. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. And so with that, I guess I'll I'll turn it back over. And what's the intent to maintain the the the, the open space? Yeah, the open space really, in terms of the plans, was just passive. What you know, basically it walks through the woods more than anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, certainly nothing in terms of any disturbance associated with it. Mm -hmm. As Jay stated, I guess my experience with the conservation subdivision design has been, and and actually. And it comes with a conversation with Jay. You notice that the property line actually follows up, so the stream is right. that open space yeah. as well. Uh, we adjusted this lot line as well, so we're going to hold the wetlands. So we're going <coughs> to maintain as much of uh, the wetland areas, the natural resources within that open space. Um, and, uh, uh, and again, from our standpoint, there's a recreation fee, you know, pay the recreation fee associated with the lot so that they develop the, you know, the town-wide fields, if you will. Sean, can you tell me what's going on behind that? I, I understand that there's a residential parcel that's in white. Yes. A residential parcel. Move west of that, and it's sloped there. No, nope. yes. up, up, yep, right, right in that right area. What, how come, uh, and, and is that part of the conservation, the open space? Yes, it is. Okay. A, a pretty good size up there right in Okay. I'm, I'm just wondering how come no test pits or anything were done there. Is it because you didn't want to traverse the stream? Exactly. There was a number of you know, Again, as we were, we were coming down through, it seemed they were getting a little bit worse. What we didn't really want to do is, is this was a kind of a difficult access. Okay. We didn't want a secondary access off All right. the main road. Can you talk to me about the flows on site too? Because I know you're talking about Tucker Brook and which way the wetlands flow toward Tucker Brook. And, and if, if Tucker Brook is tributary to either Willowdale or... Scarf uh, or uh, another river in town. When is that? That's a good question. <laughs> it goes into uh, so Beaver Brook, I believe. Beaver Brook. I believe it's, it's down to right there, right? down so. to Beaver Brook, down, down by Flaherty's Farm there, yes. and then into uh, and into the marsh north of okay. Route One. Right, the main where it crosses right there, where the Flaherty Farm mm -hmm. is, that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's the one that Tucker Brook goes right in. Uh, obviously, the general flow right now is kind of down along this way. A lot of it will be headed towards this, uh, this trib area mm -hmm. and then down into the wetlands. Obviously, the road would be intercepting all the uphill stuff associated with that. I would probably go to <coughs> the areas in front of the lots if you will, back to the road. <coughs> And then just if you would, if you wouldn't mind, Sean, talk to me about the the uh, existing hydrology north of the site where Heritage Acres are. are I think that's what it's called, Heritage yes, yes. Development. Yes, again, that's, I would say that's yep. this whole flow, if you will, I'd say it's the same type of pattern. Perfect. Okay. So with all of that on the table, I guess where I'm going with this is it seems to me like there's actually a tremendous opportunity to potentially partner between the two homeowner associations of this um, uh, proposed Tucker Brook condominium condo or whatever homeowner association it will be and heritage which was in the 1970s it seems like there's a growing demand out in that area for sanitary and I understand that development usually picks up that tab but if if we have failing septics in heritage right next door and upstream it seems to me like there's um, 
uh, more and more demand for that. So how about Portland Water District? I mean, are, are they going to have drinking water supply there out is. there? There is. There's municipal water within right. Payne Road. So, so if we got water, if we got municipal water going down there, I'm not sure why we can't have sewer going down there. I understand the cost. I understand there's a cost. But there's also a cost to failing septics that are so close to the, the Scarborough Marsh. And again, I appreciate that, but again, yep. that's an existing situation. Yep. Uh, that, uh, yep. that again, we're talking 14 lots here, so I mean, mm -hmm. it, it is going to be awful hard for us. And yep. I will say that one of our first questions was to the sanitary district was, yep. you know, are there any plans for, you know, potentially anywhere in the works at all about potentially having sanitary sewer service down Payne Road? Um, and no, there was absolutely none. And I right. mean, it's obviously going to be difficult for. For uh, my client, in terms of this particular yeah. development, to be the absolutely, the and so I, I put it sort of maybe the question back to staff too is talking about is there is there a growing demand in that area of Payne Road or in Route One for that? Um, but the other thing I want to just talk about too a little bit is you're proposing to have uh, to not necessarily uh, encroach, but not necessarily fully honor the full 75 foot setback. It sounds like on some of these lots. So again, the 75 foot setback and it. Uh, and I understand that when you have a stream protection in Scarborough that there's certain stream bodies that they have mm -hmm. the stream protection on. Uh, obviously the small tributary is not one where it's actually defined as stream protection under the, the town of Scarborough ordinance. Uh, 75 feet, I always show again, it's to the building envelope, if you will, associated mm -hmm. with that because DEP, from a permit by rule standpoint, uh, you'd require a full NRPA to have <coughs> a building within that 75 foot setback. However, with a permit by rule, uh, we can disturb within 25 feet of the stream, actually. Yes, you can, but whether or not it's necessarily the best thing for the site, it remains to be seen. I appreciate it, and that's why I, if we could kind of, you know, we're, and again, also time, so maybe people could have a little back lawn, yawn back here, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because there's no, no relaxation, unfortunately. We have to meet. It's almost on the conservation subdivision design under these standards that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, typically if I do that in the R2 zone, you get some relief yep. in terms of the setbacks. Yep. The setbacks are the same, so I have a 40-foot front yard. Yeah. Uh, no, and I appreciate you. I think, I think you're really you're pushing it to the limit here to see, you know, how far it is that we can go. But I think we've got to throttle it back just a little bit. I think there's a little bit of, uh, you know, I think compromise that, that, that needs to be made here. I have a couple other questions. Um, one, what's the year of the wetland review? Uh, the initial one was 2011, and that's the okay. one that's on the plan, which off my ex but we have we, we have been back out there again, and in we did the Favorama pools. Yes. Okay, good. Actually, I just wanted to make sure year. it wasn't 2016 with the drought conditions, because it's going to be misleading if it was 2016. Uh, good question. I think it was actually the summer, wasn't it? Yes, okay. Okay, good. <laughs> and then last but not least, where are you envisioning this um, underdrain soil filter to go? Where? Yeah. The yeah. Because uh, yeah, anywhere. Because we're pushing it to the limit here, Sean. So I'm just wondering where you're going to see it. So terraced, perhaps, on that slope. Oh, perhaps. And again, I'd, or maybe excavated into the slope. Okay. And then, you know, and then just use the slope itself on the outfall, okay. or maybe you know, bringing that down into here where we've got a flat spot in here. I mean, it's something I've been designed to sort Yeah. That. I don't see it as a huge pond associated with it. And, uh, you know, there's a pretty good fair area. If this is yeah. a 20,000 square foot lot, that's certainly a 25,000 square foot area. Again, it's a challenging site with a lot of wetlands, and I'm, and I'm just wondering if an underground drain soil filter with the soil types out there is the best, is the best proposed treatment. And I'm wide open to suggestions yeah. associated with that. But yeah. you know, when it really comes down to the end of, and again, in this case, we are going to have curbs. Mm -hmm. Curbs with catch basins, so I mean there is a certain end of the line associated when you get into that type of design. So would you potentially pitch that back to Payne Road then? Pitch the pitch the uh, curb and gutter back to Payne Road instead of having it go to a stormwater treatment facility? Uh, topographically, I don't think we're going to be able to make that work. <clears throat> All right, and, and like as my statics professor always said, you can't push on a rope, so I'm just, <laughs> yes, I'm just I, really worried I, I about that. Yeah, I think you I think so fact. too, John. <laughs> Thanks so much. That's all right. All right. Robin. Yeah, a lot of my colleagues have already uh, asked some questions uh, that that I had as well. Um, I, I think it, it, the time is coming when the town itself has got to take a look at all along Payne Road uh, as more developments come up, um, as the traffic gets heavier along there. Uh, people are going to start looking at property, uh, and it. it um, now may be the time to decide if we really need to put the sewers down Payne Road. Uh, 
rather than waiting until more sewers fail, especially in some of the older development areas. But that's not something to put on the developer this time, I believe. Um, I have uh, just a question. The land itself, is it heavily forested or open? It, it, it's, it's relatively well treated, yes. Good, 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 good tree growth. I, I was looking at something that just showed one lone tree on this map. I'm assuming that that lone tree stood for all the rest uh, of them. <laughs> it, yeah, I don't know how that... <laughs> I said, okay, well, that lone tree is standing right where a driveway is possibly going to go. <laughs> to the last tree on the lot. Yeah, no, uh, yes. It, but it's a, it's a, there's, there's a lot of trees all the way Okay. Um, lot 5. Talk to me a little bit about Lot 5, because with that 75-foot setback, the building envelope is really very small. And if you're going to have a septic system there, where, where would that? Now, the septic system is going to go where the, where the, where the past and soil is out. So a septic in the front, okay. So we have a 40-foot front setback associated with these lots. I guess it's about 40 feet if you go in terms of the building envelope. And a driveway someplace there. Yes, ma'am. Yes, it will be on one side of the other. Again, plenty of width, but then it really is the depth. Uh, so again, that's showing 75-foot setback off of the stream. Uh, obviously, I have a point right there. We're trying to swing it up nicely into there. And if I would like to, you know, if possible, uh, you know, have a... 75-foot building set now the stream, a 50-foot undisturbed buffer to the stream that would allow at least, you know, perhaps, like I say, perhaps a small lawn in the backyard. Yeah, that's, um, as I said, that, that looks rather awkward and, and problematic. Um, nothing much, I think, that you can do about it, but that that is one I noted. You no, know, I appreciate that. Now, again, the nice part is that uh, Mr. Pistachi doesn't just sell lots. He does packages. So, I mean, the nice part is you don't. Then you get no limitations associated. Mm -hmm. you know, nice, nice ranch. Uh, nice ranch is better than that well. And, uh, right, you can't put four beds from Colonials on everything. There's no doubt about it. And again, obviously, you know, uh, uh, some of the land we're looking at, unfortunately, in 2017, there's, you know, there's a reason sometimes where it hasn't been developed, and usually it's because there's uh, certain limitations with it. There's usually, uh, you know, wetland issues, uh, uh, streams, uh, uh, ledge, uh, and you're right, it's always the balancing act, if you will, trying to work around those, those limiting factors. I, I had one other, I, I, don't, I suppose you could call it musing as I looked at this. Uh, again, in looking at uh, Lot 8 and the contortions uh, involved to get to Lot 8 off of that part of the hammerhead and started to wonder how much wetlands would actually be impacted if the driveway went through more of the open land where you would at the there, Right, and it's, yeah, it's going to cross wetlands, but it's going to cross wetlands as well, um, to a, probably to a lesser extent. But it yeah, is going to cross them there. And I appreciate what you're saying. I, I truly do. And certainly Joe and I have had the same conversation, and, and I think we probably had it with Jay as well uh, in terms of access to that lot. Uh, but, you know, perhaps what we might see as a limitation in terms of this somewhat convoluted driveway is actually, you know, a selling point to somebody for that particular piece is that, you know, they're in the neighborhood, if you will, but kind of uh, offset to themselves a little bit off the end of the road. All right. Thank you very much. No, thank you. No more appreciate questions. It. Thank you. Rick? Yeah, what, do you know the, um, John, do you know the Brockton building envelope on Lot 5? you know what that is? In terms of the actual size? Yeah, that's curious. I have a steel. <coughs> and just real quickly, it would be roughly, I would say, 100 feet wide by 40 feet at its worst case deep, probably some 4,000 to 5,000, 4,000 to 4,500 square feet. Yeah, that's fine. I'd, it's hard to tell from here with my eyes. Yeah, and it's, a 60 scale is always a nice scale as well. <laughs> yeah, I need to start getting these sketches bigger. I'm going to have to move closer. Um, okay, and then the lot down the end, there's no thought to switch lot 5 down to the end and make a nice... Well, like I said, we were looking at... That no, and I'll be happy to take a harder look at that. But as I remember right, again, my thought was as when we are coming down the hill, uh, the yeah. soils were getting worse in terms of passing soils. Yeah. So I, I don't think we have passing soil. Let's say we're going back up the hill, obviously, within this area. Um, 
Right. <coughs> yeah, and that's that envelope's fine. It's it, yeah. It's, um on the total acreage the, the acreage total is twenty point seven. Yes. And then you're saying eleven point three nine is gonna be open space? Right, Michelle, right now uh, it's eleven point three nine, but I I'll, I'll be taking a small area out of that small Okay. Um, we'll give you that. Um, what's the total wetlands? Do you know? I just, I might, it's probably here. I just missed it, okay, maybe. I don't know if I have that either. Uh, I wonder what the... I'm just wondering... Wetland area outside of Floodway is at 223,000. Well, it's in the Floodway and the wetlands. It's 200 and roughly 70,000 square feet. So five, five and a half acres, if I'm doing my math correctly. All right. Still looks like you meet all the criteria, so. Thank you. Thanks. So, um, as always, by the time it gets to me, a lot of <laughs> good stuff's already been taken. But um, in a way, that's actually similar to the challenge faced with these sites, because as you were alluding to, Sean, um, a lot of the low-hanging fruit in Scarborough when it comes to home, home lots have been taken, particularly on this side of the turnpike. So. We do tend to see a lot of the, not a lot of these, but more and more of these. And by definition, they are they're tough, and they, they involve some tough trade-offs at times. But um, you clearly um, know the drill and um, appreciate your efforts to minimize the impacts on wetlands um, and also to maintain as much sort of con contiguous, undisturbed wetlands as possible. And I also understand you know, you've got a allow for stormwater treatment as well. Um, uh, I, in, in terms of the wetlands delineation, I think you said that you were just back out there earlier this year, 2017. What, and I don't know if I missed it, but what is your expectation for when you'll actually have uh, an updated delineation? Uh, this is the update. And basically what he did, the same gentleman that, the, the gentleman that I had do it in 2011 is the same guy I have on staff. Uh, so, you know, he basically went out there with his map and, and basically walked along. So this, this map that we have, this, the, the mapping that we have is based on the 2017? Well, again, but he, but he basically reconfirmed, if you will, his, his okay. 2011 uh, uh, delineation. That makes sense to you. Okay. Um, yeah, I wasn't, that wasn't entirely clear, but um, thank you. Um, yes. You mentioned nitrate analysis and that will kind of fall in the bucket of the remaining due diligence that you have. Uh, just looking back over the notes to see if we missed anything here. Um, in terms of the, uh, you know, possible extension of, of city sewer, I mean, it, this, is, this is another dilemma that we face periodically, and we always try to be opportunistic as a board and as, as a town, I think, to try and encourage applicants and owners to reach out to their neighbors to see if there's a way to leverage their uh, resources and or their maybe their shared motivations, uh, whether it be shared access, curb cuts and busy roads or things like this. At the same time, as a couple of my colleagues have, have said, we, we also understand that we can't just put it all on the latest person through the door. So um, while we would certainly encourage the applicant to explore whatever avenues there may be, and we appreciate that you've already reached out to Sanitary District. Um, at the end of the day, um, you know, don't expect you to to uh, work magic single-handedly. And if uh, others are not so inclined, there's not much more you can do. Um, I do. I am inclined to agree with, um, with others in saying that this does seem like a um, it's, it's a pretty it's a bit of a reach um, to to, uh, to ask. Ask uh, someone to tie in, given that we're talking over 3,000 feet away. So um, I think I'm okay with with septic, given that you know we, we go through the the usual due diligence there and soils and everything else, uh, as you know well. Uh, in terms of the, the stream setback, I look forward to seeing more detail on how how that's to be um, how that's to be spelled out. And another kind of recurring theme that we see is. Um, you know, you have the best intentions of the of the applicant and the initial developer, 
and builder, and then you have the challenge of how do you ensure that some of those boundaries are going to be respected going forward when ownership changes hands. So uh, we'll be interested in hearing a little more about what you have in mind there and I'm taking a look at the dimensions and <coughs> hardscaping, whatever else might be uh, in play there. Um, beyond that, I think it's all fairly typical sketch plan material at this stage and appreciate the introduction. Um, look forward to seeing the next steps. Is there any more feedback that you need from us as a board at this stage? Yo, are you okay? Anything else? Joe Yo needed to say something. <laughs> My name is Joe Fustacci. I'm the uh, applicant on this. Um, I have a question for Jenny through the chair, if I may. Sure. Do you have a number that, of people that have had field systems in the uh, Heritage egg, uh, Acres? Uh, I don't have the exact number. Um, it's it's more antidotal discussion between staff who've been okay. around for uh, years. I, I built a house um, in... Um, in 2008, and um, we were cautioned about the older plumbing standards, and we utilized the new ones, uh, and we haven't had any problems with that system. I think that there were a number of builders that went into the subdivision to build houses. The standards back in the 70s, and I've been, well, I've been building since the early 70s, they've changed dramatically, and they failed systems I think we're a fault of the, the design standards. I've built a number of septic systems and we've had no problems with them. But as um, Sean pointed out, you have a 15 inch uh, requirement uh, in this town. And I think that's going to ensure that the septic systems are going to be satisfactory and, and shouldn't fail. So, uh, you brought up some good points tonight that we will address at our next meeting. And I thank you for your time and your comments. Thank you. Um, Nick, did you have something else? Yeah, I did. Um, <clears throat> for better or for worse, I had a little time to think. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know in a minute, Nick. <laughs> yeah, well, you might not be as thrilled. Um, <laughs> yeah, on the longer term view of this all, all right, um, I do envision that sewer line probably running down Payne Road, right? If you build this out and you put septic in everywhere, the likelihood that down the road any of the owners in that development, even if they wanted to and had problems with the septic system, being able to chip in and afford a line down their road and connection into a Payne Road sewer line really is unreasonable. They're not going to do it. Once you build this thing out, nobody's going to pile their money together as a group of 10 neighbors to afford the cost of putting that pipe in and that line. So in all of my thinking time, how expensive is it to run a line down here that doesn't connect to anything, but could be connected to in the future? Well, let me. I think it's. I think there's other options to now than because I think the difference is number one. Obviously, the natural topography is coming away from pain Road. So we're looking at even if we do a gravity system within the road, we're talking about pumping it back up to pain Road probably anyway, unless we want to cut across country. So you know, our first thought is, is if the septic system is out there and pain Road does come with. Uh, uh, sewer in the future, then probably what we're talking about is one common force main. Uh, and again, I think we could probably put that out of the, and then the shoulder somewhere perhaps, or you know, outside of the right of way, uh, or in the right of way, or even in easement across some of the lots. I guess there's options there. And then if anyone's, as their septic system fails, they have to buy like an E1 pump and tie into that system or something along those lines. But, um, you know, I don't think, uh, and I see where you're coming from, I have a gravity line there in case. But I think in this case, you know, if I was on the uphill side going down, uh, that might make more sense to me than being on the downhill side of the road. Can, can I chime in too? Sure. <laughs> um, I was going to say the same thing. You could put a, do a, a low pressure force main though, and as se if septics fail, you put an E1 pump. It's very easy then that that line would be in the in the right of way, and that there would be less impact, like he was saying, to get everyone to pitch in. For the, even that, even that small system in the in the shoulder, whereas putting a low pressure force main, I don't know. It, I, I see where you're heading with that, and I think there is a way. But gravity is not it. I agree with Sean with that respect. But it, there are other ways, and other pipes you can put in. Um, you know, this is kind of interesting because I 
on Two Rod Road. I wonder how it, I wonder if there's sewer. I suspect it's probably not sewer on Two Rod Road because when we did Memory Lane, they that was all septic. <coughs> so there's quite a few developments <coughs> out in that whole area, and for one reason or another, there's no sewers out there. Um, it could be ledge or it could be. It could be possibly that, like in Heritage Acres, there were so many failures that they upgraded their systems, which cost a lot of money to do, and they decided they didn't want to go any further, you know, at that point. They brought them up to standards. Well, I, so. I think the issue is if you're talking about, right, bringing up basically, because again, it's not like it's just, you know, we're on top of the hill, let's let it all flow down. I mean, it's up and down and up and down. Yeah. You know, there's certainly, so I mean, it's it's a, it's a relatively, it's going to be an expensive project. Um, and that's why I do, th like you folks were talking about, you know, having government involved somehow or, you know, I mean, somebody's got to actually kind of, you know, run with that and yeah. come up with the front money associated with that because I do think that in terms of any existing neighborhood, I mean, you know, if, okay, we're going to put a pump, we're going to put a sewer system in front of you. As soon as your septic tank's gone, I think you saw some of this out up to eight corners, you know, you're going to tie into our sewer and we're going to charge you 20 grand to do it. I mean, it's just, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a difficult nut to crack. Mm -hmm. uh, crack. It really is. Um, I, I wonder if we should get some sort of a, um, an opinion from the sanitary district and that may. Well, I think we sort of do. I think we, it's kind of anecdotal at this point, but yeah. it sounds like there, that discussion has been had. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, with the staff, the, we can we're, certainly. We're speculating is all we're yeah. doing right now, you know. And so, so as, as I mentioned at, at our, we, as an interdepart before each meeting, as part of our interdepartment meeting, um, the sanitary district director is at those meetings. But certainly, we can um, ask him to weigh in once again on the on the question um, to provide sort of any further um, um, uh, thoughts he has on it. Mm. That would be helpful. Sure, we can add that to the, the to the list. Okay. Coming out of this, mm -hmm. I do agree. There is a bigger picture issue, and it's a little different than some other uh, sites that we look at that are way out off Broad Turn or something like that, where the, the notion of sewer is very remote and hypothetical. Right. When, when you're it's on, just yeah. close enough to be right out there on Two Rod yeah. Road, across from Memory Lane, on the other side, there's a whole development in there, and I suspect they're probably all on septic as well. You know. One more for my thinking time. Um, how tied are we to this 40-foot setback? I mean, how bound by? That was a note I jotted to myself as well. Um, basically, the standard says in a conservation subdivision design, uh, conservation subdivision, typical conservation subdivision, in an R2 district, the lots typically get a lot smaller. I think it's almost down to 7,500 square feet. Um, with much reduced setbacks, I think down downwards to 15 foot front yard and maybe to five or 10 side and rear yard. Um, but the standard goes on to say is if you're in an R2 district conservation subdivision, the R2 district that does not have sewer, you default to the space and bulk of the R2 standards, which is the 40 foot setback. Um, but that was actually I had my book out earlier, sort of looking at is if the language was crafted such because one of the things it talks about in a standard conservation subdivision with the smaller lots is that the board does have flexibility in terms of what those setbacks are. So I was trying to sort of read the language to see if it was clear one way or the other and I jotted myself a note here to explore that question a little further. So um, in my initial review sort of tonight because we really haven't seen very many of these Conservation I, subdivisions I that my don't connect to sewer that are then sort of building to the standard space and bulk standards. Um, so I'll, staff will explore that question going forward and see if there is opportunity to, uh, for the board to think about relief from the 40 foot setback. Um, or my, that's a my initial thought is if you can shave, you know, 15 to 20 feet off each setback, you can actually shift that road just enough to get that stream setback out of the way, close enough. Right. Um, or even just make sure that that stream setback is, in fact, an undisturbed buffer, if you will. Correct. You know, because that would happen, <laughs> yeah, I mean, was, even the way it sits right now. Yep. If we had as a board a little flexibility there. If we could get down to a 15-foot front setback, then, uh, you know. Uh, the, 25, the 25 feet I was kind of talking about for the back, yeah, you know, you just slide everything up there. And you're right, that would work out beautifully for us. So we'll explore that. Okay. 
I'm done thinking. Thanks. Right. And again, I think, you know, and I know Joe and I have talked a little bit. I mean, obviously, if I, I, I think if we could get that down to 15 feet from the front setback, I, I think we could be pretty comfortable in maintaining that 75 foot undisturbed buffer along that stream as undisturbed. Well, thanks. So, uh, staff has a couple mm -hmm. more guidance, and applicant will continue to work away, and we'll see you next time. Well, we thank you for your time. Thank you. Unfortunately, you get me again right now. Item number five, Prompto Oil Inc. requests sketch plan review for 318 U.S. Route 1, map U40, lot 4. Jay? <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is an application for a Prompto oil change facility, which for our standards, provided all the work is done interior, is considered a retail sale and service. Um, and. Um, just for to give the board a little bit of history, um, I've probably had you know three or four years of discussions. Um, you know, once a year or so, I've I've met with uh, with the applicant, and so this is something we've talked quite a bit about. Um, and so, um, just to give you a little history on that. Um, again, so the use meets our, our zoning criteria for the B3 district. I will also note that a portion of this property is in a stream protection overlay district, um, and there is actually an unnamed tributary stream that runs along the back side of this property, which is actually on a, on a, um, a budding property. Um, so that's a little bit in the way of a zoning context. Um, again, you'll receive staff comments. I think a number of the issues that we sort of flag for board to consider have to do with access management in and out of Route 1. Um, and uh, I've already touched on the fact that we do have the stream protection district, that, um, at least on a portion of the property, although it is outside of the area where they are proposing development, um, although there is a small structure within, within that area, that very dilapidated structure that probably has trees growing right through it at this point. I'm trying to understand what the future for that may be. Um, then, uh, as board are very familiar with, this is uh, along the Route 1 corridor, so we have uh, certain design standards with regards to buffering and screening, um, not only just in terms of sort of landscape expectations, but screening of uh, sort of overhead doors, uh, queuing lines for driveway, uh, 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 queuing lines for vehicles um, and parking areas. So those are elements that we'll want to talk a little bit about. Um, and I think at this point, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. And as I said, you have a host of staff comments that uh, we can work our way through or we talked about as we move forward. I, I, I will, I guess I should just say, as I said at the outset of the previous item, this is a sketch plan. This is a, you know, conceptual only, an opportunity for the applicant to provide the board and the public an overview of the project, um, certainly, uh, and the board to provide guidance. Certainly, should the project move forward, there'll be much more details that come forward, and we can dive into those as, as we go. Uh, but for now, that's... Thanks. I think one of the challenges we have sometimes with sketches is that there's just enough to get us really into it and asking questions, and sometimes we almost try to design things on the fly. But um, we will uh, let the applicant make their presentation. <coughs> I'm here today. My name is Kevin King. I work for Prompto. I'm here with one of the owners, Chris Capithanassis, the owner of the property, Jeff Quirk, and with Sean Frank, who you guys grilled recently. Um, I'm here basically to tell you a little bit about Prompto, what we do, and some people may not be familiar with what we do, and who we are in the greater scheme of things. Um, this photo here is our most recent Manchester Prompto. Um, put quite a bit into landscaping. It's a fairly large lot. Uh, the, these two pictures down here are from our previous last one we built just before that, which is Concord. Um, cedar, cupola, has a real nice New England look to it, as far as that's concerned. But the big thing here is what we do. 
Alta does oil changes, and we only really just do oil change. We do some auxiliary things. We don't have large impact motors. Um, we work normal hours, 8 a.m. till 5.30 p.m. Um, we like to, we don't work on Sundays. Uh, so if you need an oil change on Sunday, you have to go somewhere else. You need an oil change after 6.30 or 5.30, go somewhere else. Can't do all the oil changes. Um, we've got 17 current locations in the state of Maine. Um, we've got an additional seven in New Hampshire. This will be location number 25. Our first prompto was built in 1984. And if you visit our Forest Avenue Prompto, we've changed quite a bit in those years. We now have a big distribution plant. We're the largest oil, uh, oil change business in northern New England. And what that means is that we have to be more responsible than our competition. Um, we have 18 different kinds of oil. Our oil changes start at $21.95. Keep our prices low because we own the properties, we own the distribution, we own, we own every bit of the supply line that goes to Pronto. We're also ISO 9001 compliant, um, which means that I can track the oil from the minute it comes to the, the plant in, in Philadelphia to, to the minute it goes to the car. And we're the only API registered mom, Motor Oil Matters uh, business in Northern New England. So we have a lot of federal and state regulations. We deal with OSHA, e EPA, DEP, MEMA, and the state, state Fire Department, just to name a few. So we do oil change. We're responsible for that oil no matter where it goes, when it comes to us, where it goes after it leaves. So we're very environmentally conscious because it's economically intelligent. Um, we don't do oil changes in the parking lot. I have a competitor who shot my name, but <coughs> changes tires outside the building. Don't even understand how they do that, but they do that. Um, we have oil storage tanks in our basement. This is actually a two-story building, one story below ground. It has two means of easement for employees if there was ever a fire, which I we don't imagine that's going to happen. Then get out one side, off this side. But it's just good plan. And uh, customers will drive into the Q lane, come around the property. In this case, wait to be guided in, and in, go to the waiting area, and in about 6.2 minutes they leave. So at our store at the main mall, if they go next door to get a Dunkin' Donuts coffee, their coffee, their car is waiting outside by the time they get back. Just some of the things we do. Um, we sell we sell branded oil only. We have 18 different kinds, everything from Mobile One to Pennzoil. And I guess if we're going to do oil changes, we're just going to do oil changes. We probably ought, ought to know something about oil change. So we know a lot about that. I'm here today to answer your questions. Tom's going to talk about the site, um, and I tend to I tend to never follow my notes, which is probably not all bad. Um, but we'll be very excited to be in Scarborough. We'd be hiring uh, right off the bat five or six full-time people. Our employees make between about $25,000 and $50,000 a year. Um, so we serve a certain uh, demographic that you may have from employees in the Scarborough area. Um, one of the reasons we need to build in Scarborough, and we really like to build in Scarborough, is currently our Scarborough customers are going to the main mall. The main mall is so busy, we really need the Scarborough customers to stay in Scarborough so we can take care of all the customers. So, well, that's kind of our thought process. So, next up, front. Yes, sir. Thank you, Thank you very much. I'd be glad to answer any questions you've got. Uh, Sean Franks, Great of Texas. Uh, <laughs> this is a quick introduction to the site itself. Uh, I think we're all familiar with it uh, in terms of the location. It's probably that one piece of stuff so far. Uh, Millbrook, I believe, in Avenue or Millbrook Road is just across the street. Uh, it was general location on yeah, Route 1. Uh, there is a divided island. <coughs> uh, the end, it actually takes right to the here. Uh, in coordination with staff, we actually relocated the driveway down a little bit. What we really want to have all the features right in, right out, associated with the traffic. We don't want to have people trying to turn in from this way. We don't want people trying to pull back all again this way. So we did get this down as far as we could associate with uh, Kevin had stated the idea is basically the traffic comes in, uh, they queue up, uh, free of rest, if you will, uh, right up against the garage, and then uh, coming up back in through the site. Uh, they stay in their vehicles until they're actually directed inside, and the, uh, the work actually stops, and then they go into the office, and they come back out and get happy and proceed out. 
Uh, water is available within the U.S. Group One. We will access that. Uh, sewer is a little bit off. We have had some initial conversations with the sanitary district, and we'll coordinate how we will connect into the, the sanitary district associated with that. Uh, as we did discuss, uh, we do have a stream protection district over in this area here. Uh, as Jay stated, there is a, an old building and an old driveway. The driveway is actually, it's, it's, it's almost a vegetated driveway at this point in time. Uh, but certainly uh, uh, our intention would be is to remove that from an erosion control standpoint. Our thought would be is, you know, maybe like I have a double layer of uh, an erosion sanitation tent with an erosion control berm on the uphill side uh, all along that edge. Uh, and again, our thought would basically be is just to remove that material out of there uh, and moment seed it. Uh, basically just let it kind of uh, reinvigorate itself, uh, maybe some, some minor type of landscape and associated with it. Uh, there is a 75 foot stream setback. The stream actually only goes up to a certain point by right the what's here. Uh, again, from the, the building standpoint, we have stayed out of it. We do have an intrusion within this area here in terms of some associated parts <coughs> and uh, no stream. So again, as we stated, trying to uh, uh, balance everything. <coughs> also a residential zone back in the VSO so there's a 50 foot setback associated with that. So for this whole area, uh, basically this has been all off limits in terms of any proposed development. And we do have a minor intrusion up to here again. This is where the actual stream. So again it's almost like taking a radius point if you go from here and kind of swing in that 75 foot arc. Uh, at this point it just becomes a drainage swale. And I believe there's a while ago we actually had DDP on site to kind of confirm the limitations of that stream. So, uh, from a stormwater management standpoint, uh, we're talking probably three or four catch basins within uh, the pavement itself. Uh, they actually have an oil water separator that they're very happy with in terms of a three chamber system. Uh, from that system, again, some type of stormwater management feature within this area and through here. Actually, the relocation of that driveway helps us out a bit in terms of being able to do something like that, but perhaps again, we can understand the snow filter or something like that. Uh, the propane tank here, again, to heat the building. Uh, I've talked to somewhat about the building itself in terms of uh, the facade we'd be looking at along the Route 1 side, uh, facing Route 1, uh, the side of the entrance doors, if you will, the overhead doors along the side. Uh, understanding, obviously, uh, the associated landscape and the need to the between the parking uh, and the facility itself. <coughs> Uh, just uh, real quickly, if I can, maybe go through some of these. Uh, certainly, we do understand we're on Route 1 and the design guidelines associated with that. Uh, there was a discussion regarding perhaps a, 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 a sidewalk, if you will, along Route 1. And I think the applicant's comfortable with that up to the property line here. And down to this is right here after the existing driveway. I don't want to call that. It's actually a diagram. Uh, that's where the, the large public view of crosses Route 1. Uh, so we'd like to be able to terminate that. You know, we'll decide off if you were up to the guardrail uh, and to our property line on the other side. Obviously at that point, the guardrail there because it's about to be a huge slope coming down and, and all these things. This, uh, you know, constructing that portion of the road is not my assignment. So I'm going to go on the sidewalk up to the existing guardrail. Eventually, we're going to connect the dots. Uh, lighting will be building mounted fixtures. We, we think that's all we're going to need associated with that. Uh, we will have a, a pylon sign and uh, we will certainly look at the uh, tower <coughs> design standards associated with that. Again, we certainly understand all the uh, issues in regards to uh, uh, the <coughs> landscape and buffering associated with it. Uh, we'll certainly work with the fire department in association with uh, 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 fire access. Uh, I do think it's a lot of those different things in terms of Again, certainly look to be happy to see if we can tighten that up a little bit, uh, but it's probably going to be pretty close to what we're looking at there. Um, Snow storage, we'll certainly take a look at that. Uh, and I did discuss a little bit about the uh, the demolition on the site. So uh, uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, again, uh, I'll conclude my presentation and certainly do my best to answer any questions the court has. We are here for sketch. Again, obviously, the whole point of that was to try to obtain the feedback from the before before we spent a lot of time and effort in terms of uh, affirming up the design of the site itself. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Uh, maybe we start down this side this time. All right. I'll take a drink of water. Thank you. Thank you. 
I notice you talk faster with every presentation. I like that. You get points for that. <laughs> you still do a very thorough job. I'm talking fast. You still do a very thorough job. And I like the uh, colored print you guys gave me, too. Are all these trees existing? The most part, uh, and again, I unfortunately my landscape architect sometimes get you know in terms of but, carried away. but it is wooded down through there. It is a wooded site, right. so uh, it is wooded down through there. And I think that's when they add those trees. I think they're just trying to show that it is an existing wooded site. Can you tell me what this little happy box is? Is that a house there that I'm just can't remember? This right here. Yeah. Yes, there is an old building there, believe it or not. It's yeah. Nice G was saying it's very dilapidated. Uh, and there probably some trees that are going off. Yeah, I think I know that building. Okay. Um, the parking that you have, I, I'm guessing it's based on uh, past experience since you've done this a few times successfully. Right. Right. I mean, yeah. you'll need to come back up to the podium if you want to answer questions. Thank you. Sorry. Um, no problem. Parking for us is, is planning for employees 10 to 15 years down the road. We might be. Right. Initially, we'll need about six slots. Uh, but we, you know, at the main mall, we'll have 10, 10 employees on per day. Yeah. Mostly for us. Today. Right. But we're, that's our plan. Right. Yeah. So if you've done 24 of these, you know, I think you're confident that that's all you're going to need, I'm sure. Right. I mean, the, okay. the thing, you know, obviously the site runs itself good for car queuing. Yeah. Because some of our older sites like Bedford, that are, the state took so much property, I think we're on like 6,000 square feet. The queue lanes are just really, really tight. Yeah. Try to leave yourself in plenty of room. Okay. All right. I like that you haven't had a major <coughs> spill or anything. Ever, I guess. Have you been in business since 1984? Is that yes. when you started? That's when uh, Chris started the first one. Yeah? Yep. That's a good safety record. Um, all right. And I guess so there's a looking at this sketch, and I think what I gather from the notes, it's right turn in and right turn. It's right turn in, right turn out. That's correct. So yes. Yes. You're not going to be messing with so The whole intent is right turn in and right turn out. I like out. that, too. It, and there's the end of the island, and again, I understand that, but, you know, we really need to be, obviously, to be able to queue around and come back in again. My initial design actually had the driveway, you know, as far over as I could get it, you know, just like this staff and pull, uh, pull it over. Uh, so at least that it's the full, the full island in front of us, and it's over the left side. Yeah, that's well. probably a good idea. You can't control sometimes, you know, <laughs> yep. what people try to do, but... Yeah, Route 1 right down the street from the police station, I don't think you'll have Well, a, that's a nice thing. And I do think, you have a lot unfortunately, of it's busy there, enough I that I, hopefully people won't try to get foolish. Yeah, I, I, doubt, we'll, I doubt we'll see much of that. I mean, um, is it going to look very similar to this one with the cedar siding? Yeah. That's nice. Um, I think it looks good. I could use a prompto there, so I'm good with it. Thanks. Great job. <coughs> Yeah, uh, I think we've learned on the planning board that sometimes dilapidated buildings can have historic value. Have you uh, done any checking? I can't say as I've done that, although if that one has historic value, I would be, I would be very surprised, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, I don't think there's any basement to it whatsoever. Uh, it's really one room, isn't it? Oh, can you, can you, would you mind coming up and just introduce yourself? Thanks. <coughs> <laughs> uh, it's on. Yep, it's really okay. more for the TV. So. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, Jeff Quirk. I'm the property owner. And uh, that building uh, in 67 or 68, they widened Route 1. And there was a couple of buildings, which is now the Granite Place. The place where oh, yeah. granite. That was one of them that was moved back and put on a foundation. This one was moved back and put on a real short foundation. It was supposed to have a knee wall. And uh, they moved it back and, and never occupied it and never renovated it. So it's it literally hasn't been. When I bought it, I was going to have, we had an oil company. And that was going to be in our office. And uh, I later found out after I bought it that the scout was only restricted in the state. So it, I just kind of left it for a while. But it is it's pretty rough. That this building is part of value. Uh, the raccoons enjoy it. I don't think there's any historic value. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
I would be remiss if I didn't uh, kind of reflect Susan Auglis for a few minutes. Uh, and that is uh, because the parking is located essentially along the front, along Route 1, uh, the standards do ask that whenever possible the parking be located to the rear or the side of the building. Uh, I don't really see an alternative to, to what you have there, but there are some strict landscape standards in terms of screening of the uh, uh, of that area. So I I know that uh, Ms. Auglis will be really interested in uh, what you do. And we do want to say that obviously with parking like this, you know, the potential, and again, they close at 5.30, so there's no water. There's no water. There's no water. There's no water. There's the headlights, we don't. So we, the intent here is what they were showing on this initial sketch was this being a landscape burn. So we'll burn there, if you will. Uh, this is actually lower than the road itself, so we have a, a little bit of help associated with the parking. Yeah. Well, as I said, I suspect that's going to be... Uh, you, you will be questioned in terms of the of the plantings that go in the type of trees and uh, the caliper measures and just about everything else there. Um, I have a, a question on uh, when the oil comes in, where is it unloaded or how is it? If I, if I could, just to sort of build on that, there's a you know, reference in the application of the oil, hand, oil, oil handling procedures and Maybe to piggyback on what you're asking, Rachel, if you could just very briefly walk us through yeah. what that kind of chain of custody is and how that process works. Um, in this particular case, <coughs> this particular case, uh, a box truck and oil truck. So they would come here and back up to Bay Three, and they they have a hose they take from that. They actually take it downstairs. We don't like to take the risk on outside valves. Uh, build oil, so we actually have our own employee goes downstairs and builds it from the top in the oil container. Uh, when that's how that oil goes, in. when a car comes in, there's actually a hole in the floor. It's about uh, four foot by about two and a half feet wide. <coughs> and all the oil, when it comes out of the car, goes straight down into the basement of this container that catches it. When that container gets to a certain level, there's a pump that pumps it into a waste oil container another thousand gallon container that's in the basement. When Clean Harbors comes in, they likewise come in here, turn around, back up here, they again take the hose down, their hose down to the basement, and they pump the oil into the container. The importance of how, you, how we handle oil is we have to do business with a vendor that does that for their primary business. And Clean Harbors has a division that just does waste oil. And, you know, they have, because we are responsible for that oil no matter where it goes. So, so, you know, I've had even, uh, I think Farmington called me this last year, wanted to pick up some of our oil from the waste oil burner, and we can't do that. We can't give anybody any oil. We can only take the oil because we were responsible for where it goes. So some, somebody, actually the other one who called me this year was uh, one of the, Mike Mufford, Mike Mufford down in, Rochester, one of my barrels of oil. So we are responsible for that product wherever it goes. We have special places that we, we do. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that, that does. Thank you. I have a follow-up question. Is that all done after hours? No, that's usually. Uh, you, well, it, it could be before hours. Um, we're, we don't really take oil after 5.30 at night, but the guy might get there at 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, it just depends on what the schedule Sometimes if we don't allow anybody even to work the ground before six in the morning. So the soonest they could get there is by seven. When the oil truck goes back to our warehouse, it has to be one hundred percent unloaded for the employees to go home. We can't leave any oil in the oil truck because there's too much risk in that. Even though it's an accident that might never occur, if you don't plan for it, it will occur. Yeah. Okay. I do think, and I think it's something I was remiss in terms of specifically spelling out to the board, is that, <coughs> right, that this does have a full basement associated with it where all the tanks associated with this are, so uh, everything is, you know, within concrete walls, which basically does act as secondary containment associated with that, and obviously they have a lot of protocols associated with handling them. I'm sorry, so the oil tanks in the basement, I, I don't know that we need to talk about this, but just you know, we have a, we have a berm around the control of the oil tank. So, and then third containment the building itself is the burn. We have no domains in the Okay, so in other words, you know, even we don't even have a mop sink in the basement. We have to 
wash their hands and wash their face. Likewise, like that, we actually have our mop water taken away by clean heart. So that mop water doesn't even go into the municipal system. So we go through seven gallons of mop water per day per location. And that water is held in a 275 gallon tank. Clean heart and we pump out the waste of our water. It's a question about whether we need to do it. But we're somewhat careful about what we do because people live here too. So just to kind of company philosophy. Uh, and uh, I guess one one final question: um, When when you have dead end lots, which essentially this is uh, by the standards, there there has to be a place or a way for the vehicles to safely turn around. Um, what as I as I look at that, uh, if we have fire trucks that come in there, uh, is there space for them to turn around to back up? No, that was a good question in terms of you know, and I and I have to admit. I mean, It, it just one one thing that I did. Um, I, actually I, I again, okay. I actually, I actually met with the fire department. Okay, they promised me they'd use their short fire truck. I didn't have to have turnaround for the big fire truck. So I met with each each different division. Actually, I didn't tell you. About that. <laughs> yeah. <I'm sorry. laughs> I appreciate that being in. That's good information to have um, when you submit mm -hmm. the the plan. Uh, I had was musing a little bit and had wondered about just an emergency. Uh, exit where you already have the curb cut when the old um oh no 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 <laughs> no no, 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 no they won't let me <laughs> okay jay won't let me do that <laughs> you wouldn't <laughs> well the uh the ordinance in the planning board review process suggests that uh each site should only have one curb cut for access management purposes unless the applicant can demonstrate that a secondary access would provide a beneficial um, to the traffic flow, access management, traffic safety. So the, the onus is really to demonstrate that it's a net positive, not just a net neutral. Um, All right. As I was looking, the, the curb had already been cut there on the old driveway. That's what I was thinking in terms of simply holding it as an emergency exit option. Um, all right, I think that answers my questions. Thank you. Thank you. And just get ready for the uh, landscape questions yes. from Ms. Oglis. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thanks. Robin? Yeah, so just following up on um, Ms. Henderson's question about the loading and unloading, I'm wondering if that's a curbed area there then where the truck comes in. Is, <coughs> are you planning to curb that uh, to confine it for any reason in, in the event that there's a valve or a hose leak on the truck that comes and loads or unloads anything? The guy has hazmat pads that he can slide underneath the, the valve. We actually, when it comes to the warehouse, we actually slide a, mm -hmm. a tub underneath the, the joint. Mm -hmm. and it pulls back in to unload. We could certainly do that. There. Okay. Not and so you do it every time or only when you see a leak? No, actually, we only ever do it when it comes back to the warehouse. We haven't. Not okay. I need to talk about then the uh, stream zone. Uh, can you, Sean, you said it, it's like it disappears right there where the loading and unloading is going to go. Talk to me about the stream there. Uh, the actual stream itself? Yep. yep. This is actually, it's a well defined drainage whale that's coming mm -hmm. down in through here. It was actually at this location that it was classified as a stream, if you will. Yep. Uh, which is really, again, a very small tributary, if you will, coming down through Mill, to Millbrook, which is the crossing mm -hmm. So, um, you know, what I'm holding is, this is the stream district, if you will. The stream protection district is uh, from this stream body over here, this body of water over yep. here. Again, for this small trip, I basically held the set, I showed the 75 foot stream. Set back, right, to the structure. Yes. And what I'm concerned about is that weight, the loading and unloading is going to happen very close to that 75 foot and without a curb to contain if anything happens with the truck. I'm, I'm a little bit uncomfortable yeah, with right. that. No, again, we actually have a, this is a wall all along yep. the so I think it's sort of like a little knee wall associated yep. with that. Extend that up six inches. Excellent. Uh, it will be, you know, I mean, the thing will be, it will be heading to the cash base, like I can see. Yep. I think the other part of that would be, is, yep. you know, the, uh, the oil water stuff right Okay, and those catch basins are for stormwater That's correct. kind of thing. Yes. Okay, and then the dumpster is that, and I, I've noted in your plan too that it's primarily just cardboard 
and uh, packaging materials in the it's a, at the top of the page it says Prompto maintains a double dumpster system. I just want to make sure that there's no liquids going in the outside dumpster. Um, there's two dumpsters. Mm -hmm. The first dumpster is cardboard and containers. Second right. dumpster is for the oil. And that's going to be in that same enclosure? And that enclosure has a lip all the way around it. Okay, and that's for the waste oil filters once yeah. they've been drained? Yeah, so in case there's ever a spill there. It would be okay, and there's... there's uh, Maybe, what I would recommend that you do too for, for when you come forward is talking a little bit more about that and what your typical waste oil filter dumpster looks like because having that outside is right, you know, within 75 feet of that stream setback is, you know, makes the hairs on the back of my neck go up just a little bit. I appreciate that. Okay. You make sure you have information. All right. Excellent. Um, while you're right there, Kevin, um, what's the typical volume of both virgin oil and waste oil that you maintain on site on a daily basis? Well, I'm only allowed to put 90%, so we're looking at probably, probably looking at a couple thousand gallons of virgin oil that mm -hmm. spot. The newest thing is because we have so many varieties of oil, mm -hmm. we have specialized box containers of oil. Okay. Okay, and uh, you know, and we get have barrel oil as well, mm -hmm. and we have large tank oils. Okay. Oils. And how large is your waste oil container? Waste oil container. Okay, so we're talking 3,000 gallons at any given time, but I like how you're talking about secondary and, and tertiary treatment with the no floor drain in the basement. That's, that's good. Um, and then the grading of the site, is, are you envisioning the grading, Sean? Obviously, you're going to be toward catch basins kind yes. of a thing. But if you can just talk a little bit about the grading, which way it's going to drain. It's all coming up. Obviously, we have to move one now. We are lower, so the thought is, but I'm thinking like the catch basin here, Catch basin here, catch basin in the center to the to the uh, uh, to the only water separator, and then okay. And so, in line with those those catch basins, are we talking about another oil water separator in line with the treatment train in case anything happens in the parking lot? Right. So okay. Basin, 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 oil water oil separator. Water separator, storm water filter, or something. something, and then it happens. Okay. Good. That's all my question. Oh, one more thing. How much disturbed area are we talking about here? Uh, it's only a 1.1 acre site, so it's the total disturbance will be okay. 0 0.6, 0 0.7. Okay, and 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 again to to just echo, maintaining the the natural vegetation is important and understanding landscaping as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. I don't have a whole lot else to add. Um, I was thinking of the queuing lines. If I was stuck here and. Uh, this man's car and I got a phone call and I have to go somewhere and I've got two two cars queued behind me, three in front of me and three getting an oil changed, you know, how do I get out of that situation? Well, you're right. I would say is, you know, <laughs> I think once you're here, if there's two or three cars behind you, then, you know, the nice part is the employees are there. I mean, I think you can slide one through, you get it back in there. I, and I've utilized promptos before, but, you know, I, I look at it and said, geez, do you have, I mean, I think Rachel may have mentioned it, do you have an opportunity for a, you know, unofficial quick turnout through that driveway or something? You know, maybe a do not enter or emergency vehicle signs somewhere on there, you know, to deter people from using as a pass-through, but kind of leaving it available. Uh, I'd the have thought. to look at the grades, but again, I think it was the proximity more to the stream than anything else. I think it was, uh... <coughs> <laughs> This happens to us when this is a similar site to Concord. The advantage here is Concord has a one world, one way driveway. This is actually wide enough for two, two ways. So if somebody got stuck there, we have an employee stop the car, push it over, and let the car out. I mean, this is actually a little wider than one way specifically for that. I would love to have this driveway over here too as an emergency for people to leave their stuff in the driveway. I was told I could. So, whatever you'd like to do. <laughs> I strongly recommended that you not go forward with it. And the only thing else I'll echo is um, the need for the landscaping, and you know this, and Susan will certainly let you know this when she returns. Um, the dumpster enclosure as well, I think, um, you know, it's highly visible, kind of in an open area there, just to make sure that that's going to be made with some sort of materials that are sturdy and look nice, and because they're going to be visible as you come into the property, so. That's it. Thank you. Roger. Okay. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, 
Sean, are you are you thinking that people driving south on Route 1 will be able to come right in, or do they have to go further down Route 1 and make a loop around and come back? Right. It's only going to be northbound in traffic is all we're talking about. Northbound, northbound. in, northbound out. Okay, because on your sketch northbound, there. yes. <laughs> on your sketch there, that, that little needle on that island there doesn't appear to be on your Maybe it is. I just can't see it. That needle, you know how it narrows down that the yes. island? Okay. That's the that's for the left turn in traffic to go right, yeah. to the Millbrook yeah. Okay. So anybody wants to head south they're gonna to have to go north and somehow make a turn and in into the town hall and then make <laughs> yes, uh, but again I don't think that's unique and certainly not yeah. you know not to Scarborough and certainly not unique to Route 1. I mean, certainly there's a lot of areas where that are, you know, they have divided highways and that, you know, uh, your access is limited to the side of the divide you're on. Okay. Um, I, I just kind of curious about the, uh, the basement, too. Um, I think it was mentioned that the, the uh, pit is going to be four feet deep. <clears throat> Basement's eight. Basement's eight feet deep. Okay. The platform that blocks up, it's, it, the pit is actually about four foot by about two and a half foot wide. Oh, okay, all right. That's, that's just a cut before. Yeah, okay, yeah, all right. Yeah, full basement with uh, OSHA steps going on both sides. Okay, all right. I was just kind of curious about that. Uh, actually, I, you know, I, I think it's going to be great, great business on Route 1, so I have no further. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't have a whole lot to add. Um, I appreciate the introduction and the attention to detail and some of these materials and the kind of the overview of the, the business model and the thought process. We don't always need to know all the nitty-gritty details about the business, but in this case, it's yeah, we, 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 we thought it might be good to have a little introduction so to the company in this case. we prepared with that, um, and uh, <coughs> certainly some, you know, it is, again, sketch stage, so certainly some, some more to do here. Um, I, I will say, and there, I guess there were a couple references to it. The architecture, um, you know, to the extent that we've seen it, I think looks good or promising. Um, you know, it is sort of the New England vernacular. Um, just for the record, you don't have to have a cupola. That may be, <laughs> that may be part, I, I appreciate that, might, maybe that's part of your branding at this point, but just for the record, uh, you don't have to have a cupola to, uh, to, to meet our design standards. Um, but we'll look for more detail on that and, and uh, and landscaping, as, as was referenced. Um, there was discussion about uh, providing curbing or a new wall at that loading area, which I, I agree that that's important given the proximity to the stream area there. A um, little more detail on dumpster, the two different dumpsters and the enclosure detail. Um, and uh, sort of, I guess, getting back to the landscaping idea, the screening and buffering in general, particularly with the traffic along uh, sorry, the, uh, the parking along Route 1. So um, with that, I think that pretty well sums it up. Uh, do you need anything more from us at this point? Gentlemen, you good? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Appreciate it. Item, item number six, <laughs> CPRC group requests sketch plan review for 70 Pleasant Hill Road, map R77, lot seven. Okay. <coughs> uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to be sure I have my right comments here. This there is are this, two of these yeah, this Pleasant is, Hill items. This is the sketch plan, correct? Yep. I want to be sure. Yep, okay, CPRC, sorry. Um, as you just noted, this is yet another sketch plan for the board. So again, an opportunity uh, for the applicant to provide an overview of their conceptual build-out or, or design for their property and for the board to provide some uh, overarching commentary as the uh, applicant moves forward. Um, as noted, this property is in the industrial district. Um, the site's actually uh, home to uh, a... Um, 
a transfer station, which many of you at the table here may have frequented upon occasion, where the town currently has a lease agreement or contra contractual agreement to enable uh, a residence to dump yard waste and bulk, uh, bulk materials at the site and it ultimately gets transferred away. Um, the applicants are proposing to move their operations um, and reutilize the site for, I believe it was six lots, um, six uh, industrial lots um, moving forward. So um, just a couple of comments just in terms of at this point uh, process. Uh, really the first step is a subdivision process to divide the lots out. Um, in talking with the applicants, they're not, they, they have some conceptual plans they provided uh, for the ultimate build out of the lots, but that's not necessarily what they're going to do. They're, they may lease or sell or who knows what's going to happen with the lots, but just give you a sense of that. Um, so really staff comments focus primarily on the subdivision component and in that <clears throat> uh, we've really talked a bit about um, just trying to understand issues around access easements and access management, uh, infrastructure easements and uh, connections in terms of sewer in particular, I think the sanitary district was interested in, but all the others as well. Um, so I guess with that, um, yeah, I think I've sort of touched on the key elements for staff at this point and uh, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. All right, and I'll turn it over to the applicant. <coughs> I think it's on already. Uh, my name is Harris Harris. Uh, I'm from Stantec, and I have with me here uh, Jim Hilton from CPRC Group. Uh, he'll help answer any questions uh, relevant to the sentence and the vision of the property that I'm going to walk you through the, uh, the proposed subdivision plan as it stands right now. Uh, the site, as Jay mentioned, is on Pleasant Hill Road. Uh, it is bounded by Glasgow Road here to the right of the Glasgow Road, uh, Gibson Road is over here, and then Runway Road. So we're here at the hundreds of all four sides, basically. It is an almost 15 acre site. Uh, it's lot 7 on the tax map, 077, or 077. Uh, as Jay mentioned, the community recycling center is, is this portion of the site right here. The rest of the site, uh, CPRC uses for the uh, material conversion uh, uh, business. Uh, the business itself is under uh, front end of the licensing for all the uh, solid materials. Uh, they mentioned this is an industrial zone. Uh, Entrances to the existing site, we have an existing uh, entrance here that's gated uh, off of Glasgow Road, and then the primary entrance is the Mr. Rocco Pearson Road. Um, and then obviously the uh, community recycling center that is going to be off the road. We do have uh, resource wise on the site, so there are, uh, there's an area of wetlands um, which we have delineated. It's not really shown on the existing conditions map yet, but it's shown on our subdivision plan, so I'll just go over that now. It's uh, about 34,000 square feet. Uh, it's going to be deemed to be not significant, significant or not of special significance. Uh, also on the site, we have two detention ponds, uh, two wet detention ponds that are, that are existing. Um, and both of them drain to to uh, Pleasant Hill Road and a ditch network across the Pleasant Hill Road by the DOC facility. So that's the existing site. Uh, we, as Jay mentioned, we are proposing a six lot uh, industrial subdivision. Uh, we have a couple of uh, um, pieces of property left out that will have the uh, detention ponds on them uh, that will be retained, you know, just by CPS. <coughs> The lots that we're proposing right now vary in size from 50,000 to about 93,000 square feet. Uh, a little bit of size in the zone, 20,000 square feet, so we're over the uh, stipulation. We're proposing two primary accesses, accesses to the site. Uh, 
again, utilizing the existing access off the glass cover road off of Kitchen Road. We're proposing right now to do private streets, two short step streets. It's a wide anyway. Probably not for ditches. We did show a conceptual site plan, partly for our use and also for your education. Give you an idea of what uh, development on the site might look like. I think so. So again, this shows the, the two axes off of, of uh, primary axes off of Glasgow and off of Gibson. The one off of Gibson was for uh, two, two of the lots. Last was for uh, three larger lots. The prop piece of the property that's leading for site concerns is shown a little more here, which is the an entrance and the property of the zone off the front of the road. Uh, our thinking right now, uh, stormwater wise, is to uh, make or reconfigure this existing wet pond uh, near the wetland portion of the site. There's a, there's a fairly large bubble that around this plant that the size is. Uh, we would be considering this site. I know Rob has been asking this question. We'd be considering the site of redevelopment uh, potential project. It's currently on this holding purpose. So we'd be looking to the impact on the redevelopment project. Um, treating all of our stormwater from development to be this single wet water. I really thought uh, we were going to do a here in the site on it. So. There. Utility wise, we have uh, water, public water, and sanitary sewer on, on both sides. So we'll be bringing the utilities from each direction. And we did uh, do a little bit of work grading wise. Uh, we want to get rid of some material. Thank you. Um, Robin. Yes, I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> this project is so bittersweet because commercial paving has been such a good partner for so many environmental projects that I've worked on personally throughout um, the state of Maine. Um, they serve a really important role as far as um, re beneficially reusing otherwise waste materials. So as much as I love to see the sort of, you know, regrowth in Scarborough, it's, it's, it's hard to have that resource leave Scarborough. So just to get first things first straight, the transfer station is staying? Yes, no? Okay, thanks. Um, so we have a contract with the hotel yeah. in 2019. Okay. Um, we haven't discussed anything beyond that with the town. Okay. Uh, we're proposing a potential building site on it before we're open to <coughs> redevelop it. Okay. Trying to find a way to work further in the future with the town. Okay. Uh, while we won't be repurposing materials in Scarborough, mm -hmm. uh, we'll continue as a business to repurpose materials. Excellent. We run the Riverside uh, Transportation with the City of Portland. We entered into a long-term contract with the city 20 plus years mm -hmm. uh, just this past year, which has allowed us to access our other main processing facility mm -hmm. right outside of Auburn, mm -hmm. uh, which we have systematically, it's a couple hundred acre piece of property next to the airport up there on our travel road. Uh, we have systematically uh, improved the permits 
departments on that site being a little more phased if we're going to affect the, 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 the uh, a week of Thanksgiving to um, start to finalize the last piece of the permit loop for that. Everything that we do in the start for the most part of the special waste piece of our business, which you're probably very familiar with, um, shingles, wood, gypsum, the kind of brick castle, that will be continued. So the materials will be available and many that just won't be available to be made from Scarborough. Got it. Uh, so they'll be around. Thanks. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. Um, so um, a couple of things, <coughs> I, and I'm really pleased to have Darren as your engineer too, and I, I think that he's got a good handle on what's going on here so far because it sounds like you're moving into the voluntary remediation action plan sooner rather than later. So I was wondering if, and what that means is basically we're taking a potentially, a site with some potential contamination and getting a no further action from DEP, which is, is a huge undertaking. And I really applaud you all for, for doing that. So I'm wondering, have you talked at all, I, I understand you're using some of the existing piles as, as inert fill or beneficial reusing it as fill on site, as Darren mentioned. So um, will you be sharing a sampling and monitoring plan of those soils that will be used as inert fill um, with the town and with the planning board? Um, because the question comes from if those are now the soils that stormwater will run across or percolate through, we want to make sure that those are clean soils, Jim. Yeah, right. um, or state lines. Exactly. For sure. Yeah. Um, but number one, the, the property is itself built on the materials which we make. Okay. It has been for the you know, 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, we have, uh, while we have um, the different size piles and different types of material that are raw material, we also have some Okay. Um, any of the materials that we use on the site would not be raw material pile materials. So they mm -hmm. would be made into finished products. Okay. Uh, it would be in our beneficial use license material. Mm -hmm. and we would get that all through the BRAP program. Which we're talking about right. The right. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the department and the town would be in lockstep with that process. Excellent. And, and do you, uh, either of you, foresee there being observation wells and monitoring wells around this site? In perpetuity or in over a certain period of time? I, I don't envision that, but if okay. we're in the front end of the process, not in the back end. In the back okay. End, so I can't Super. If you could just keep us informed, perhaps um, through the staff, that would be yeah. that would be great. Um, again, it's bittersweet. I love to. I'm I'm excited about it. Um, <laughs> so, Darren, can you talk a little bit about what the disturbed area is that we're talking about here, the, the, the a number of acres kind of a thing? Well, the whole site is, uh, is disturbed now. <coughs> Got it. Uh, That's a good point. The, well, uh, I, I don't mean, but the, the weather is Right, okay. So, but you don't have you don't plan on having any off-site off-site laydown areas or anything like that for any of the materials. Okay, um, a couple, of, and I know that you're still thinking about what to sort of morph the stormwater features into. Um, that's I'm I'm very interested in that as you can imagine. But also one of the things that um, is also very bittersweet about this project is the the large amount of wetland impact fees. Um, I think it's uh, on page three or something like that. It's uh, approximately 34,000 square feet wetland impact area could be possible could possibly be mitigated by paying a fee in lieu into a compensation fund. What happens with those funds? And I and this is more kind of for staff too. Is those wetland impact fee funds? go to a state program. And, and so if we could work with staff maybe to find a local project that those funds could be filtered to, perhaps in the same watershed or just in the same town. Otherwise, that big check that you have to write goes to the state and the town of Scar Scarborough doesn't get any benefit from it all. Yep. So if I could just put the bug in staff's ear to sort of be thinking about that. And I'd be happy to think of a couple things if you need help. Um, but otherwise, this is, uh, you keep doing what you're doing. So glad to have uh, Darren on board for this. Excellent. Thanks. Rachel? 
Yeah, I, I really appreciate the fact that that slide is in color because I must confess, as I was looking at the uh, the the um, the map, uh, the schema in our packet, I was having a great deal of difficulty figuring out where the roads were, where the parking lots were, uh, and and what the access was. Um, I, I know this is uh, preliminary. Uh, I am looking at you know, a reasonable amount of green where that hasn't uh, existed before. I, and I assume that that green is going to be landscaping, trees. Right. Yeah, it would, it would be. Uh, we've actually talked about doing some burning between the uh, lots as well. And, um, I'll so we would be seeing a, a gain of. of you know, a, a substantial gain to me of, um, yeah, yeah. I, that slide actually, and, and your response answered my question, so I appreciate that. Thank you very much. So, Rick? Um, I know you haven't got, uh, the buildings aren't dedicated to anybody right now or whatever, but, and you, that's just kind of conceptual. Thing, but it is very well thought out how you have, or at least to me it appears to be very well thought out how you have the the, the bigger loading areas on the buildings with less parking, so that's more of a material handling, and then the what looks like an office building has a little baby load. So, um, you know, if you don't have anybody in mind, it's actually pretty well thought out from what I can see for um, potential um, potential clients so um, I guess there's really in mixed use they can use it for anything that fits the industrial park uh, criteria Jay so we don't Correct. really yep. it's, uh, yeah yep. okay I mean that's areas that's what that's used for now right so yeah I think it looks really good actually I don't really have any questions other than the comment that you don't have if you don't know what those buildings are for yet, you did a nice job of laying them out. And I have one more. So I'm sure my esteemed colleague here will make sure that all the water is treated well. But is that all? Can you educate me? Is that all fed from piping? From do you have stormwater drains in there or whatever that that all feed back down to that filtration system? Yeah. Uh, imagine uh, the majority of the site will be drained to this this either conveyed uh, ditches or swales or Okay, so it'll be a mix of how the water gets there, but yeah. okay. And, you know, for the time being, I think decided not to touch this platform. Okay, is that last piece right there, the white piece? Is that part of the development actually? But not you're not. It's, it's not we don't oh, you don't own that. Okay, I'll just it look like it should have been, but um, yeah. Oh, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, I don't have any. Um, I don't have any questions right now. Let's Thanks. Um, actually, um, I don't really have any questions either. I, th I think it's going to be very interesting. Robin obviously asked some very pertinent questions, and and I think what Rick said about the layout looks looks good at this point. It's going to be really interesting to see how this develops along the way. So I, I don't have anything else. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would agree. It seems to be up seems to be <coughs> off to a uh, promising start, and um, look forward to seeing how it evolves. Definitely have a little bit of a different look and feel, um, which you noted, less impervious area. Um, one of the staff's comments, and uh, I don't know if this is something you're, you 
prepared to speak to you now or could present to us at a, at a future meeting would be sort of a, a brief overview of sort of the VRAP program and how that works in terms of remediation of the site. <laughs> well, maybe we can have a workshop on it or something, but I, I think yeah, it's something we could. Sure. Yeah. That's something that we'll just file that under uh, to be continued then. So. Um, right. Uh, no, I don't, I don't think I have anything to add, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing the next iteration. Thank you. Staying on Pleasant Hill Road. Oh no, panels. <laughs> Item number seven: V E B and E Enterprises oh. Inc. requests a site plan amendment, 148 Pleasant Hill Road, map R78, plot 45. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, staying with the uh, industrial district theme, though we're transitioning away from sketch plan and into actual. Uh, potentially actionable items by the board if you're so inclined this evening. Um, this is a site plan amendment for property on Pleasant Hill Road. It is at 148 Pleasant Hill Road. Um, many of board members may recall this site from, I believe it was last summer, it was initially approved um, in a, um, for a few, uh, some building expansions. It was actually Cobble Hill Trailers at that time it was going to be moving into the site. Um, and board members are probably familiar. There's been a lot of site work happening, uh, by and large. The parking area has been redone. The stormwater facilities have been in, and a lot of the other work has been done. Um, but the initial tenant, the Cobble Hill trailer, um, is no longer part of the project. And there's a, a new uh, tenant, uh, Herc uh, Enterprises. And in a discussion that our uh, commercial code inspector was having with uh, folks, um, it came up that there's actually going to be a fuel, uh, fuel tanks brought on site. And that sort of raised some flags because those weren't on the plans and also raised some pl flags as we are in the aquifer protection district area. So I sort of pumped the brakes and said, well, we need to do a, a site plan amendment and go through the review process before those can uh, be established. So. The applicants before you with that site plan amendment. <clears throat> really, it's modifying uh, sort of the building in the middle of the, of the site. It's getting uh, quite a bit smaller than the original approval and bringing in the uh, fuel tanks. Um, as noted, the applicants prepared uh, some documentation as to how they uh, proposed to meet the standards of the Aquifer Protection Overlay District. Staff had um, some outstanding questions in those regards to be sure that we're hitting all those standards. Um, Let's see, what else did I have jotted down here for my notes? I think those are really, I think the aquifer protection and, and the fuel tanks are really the big takeaways. And then just in terms of the site, there were some very modest uh, sort of site adjustments that we noticed in terms of dumpster locations, um, ensuring that we have the emergency access through the proposed gates. Um, and finally, uh, pretty uh, a detail with regards to the uh, the guardrail that's currently on site that we believe is intended to be removed, but want to be sure of that. Um, oh, and I think the other one we, um, that was raised had to do with uh, understanding the details for the site lighting around the fuel tanks, uh, that that's a full cutoff fixture and all those typical things we look at. So uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I will turn it back to you at this time. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Frank. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the board, <coughs> thank you, Mr. Vago Technics. Um, I do apologize that they are uh, the environmental uh, engineer for uh, Herc Rentals. Uh, unfortunately, couldn't make it to the meeting this evening. Uh, I'll do my best uh, in terms of uh, uh, batting for her on this one. Um, as, as Jay stated, I think everyone's pretty familiar with the site. Uh, Pleasant Hill Road here, and we had a drive from this location, <coughs> existing building, a number of uses here. Pinsky, I think, was the last one that we had it through there. Some filler maintenance. Uh, the applicant come in uh, at that originally. We were going to have a larger building expansion, a couple of phase building expansions in this area here. 
uh, the existing uh, uh, concrete pad and the, uh, uh, the pool tank is going to be removed as part of that. Uh, and it's going to be used for the to build uh, uh, trailer sales and service to the trailers. Um, there's also an expansion uh, of the tear down and expansion associated with the existing build up in this one. So that's pretty much the same. The J data basically how the site was pretty much under construction, if you will. The, uh, uh, the utilities at all, they've been realigned as, as, as requested. Uh, the storm drain subsurface, uh, excuse me, vegetated grass under the drain soil filter had been installed. Uh, pavement was all being going down uh, in accordance with uh, the approved plan. Uh, and then all the hill basically was uh, up and up. That they uh, uh, were no longer just interested in the property. And I don't know the specifics of it, but uh, anyway, they were no longer in terms of our, our company. The applicant has worked now with Kirk uh, Rental, who is currently a, in Scarborough on Gibson Road, as we speak now, uh, in terms of relocating to this facility. It will allow them, if you want to, uh, take that existing building to upgrade it to their new use uh, and to, uh, to have some additional space from their, their current location. Part of that was uh, actually installing the fence around the perimeter of the site, uh, which is shown uh, within this location here. Uh, with the fences, and we will certainly provide the uh, knock boxes to our fire department association. And then, obviously, one of the main aspects associated with this uh, was a fuel item. And the fuel item can contain uh, 4,000 gallons of diesel or 500 gallons of, of uh, gasoline. Uh, it's only been utilized uh, by the applicant, obviously, uh, for their uh, rentals. Uh, basically, what they do is, you know, you have uh, aerials and small backhoes and that type of thing that they rent out. Uh, and obviously they have the service inside of what they need to associate with that equipment, uh, doing fueling with it and then take it off site and bring it to the customer who uses it for a day, a week, a month, whatever it may be, and then go and pick it back up and bring it back to the site. Do the general maintenance associated with it again uh, and uh, install it on site. It is all impervious. Uh, but obviously, once we started talking about this area here, and in terms of the fuel and the carrier fuel, uh, that a lot, of, a lot of questions from staff, and specifically in terms of the that, the, uh, the, uh, the protection standards, the aggravate uh, protection uh, overlays. In terms of the island itself, it's basically a concrete pad. Uh, there's collars all around the thing. Uh, it's uh, <coughs> above ground storage tanks. Uh, they're double walled. Uh, they do have overfill alarms, uh, interstitial uh, 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 alarms in, in terms of within the spaces between the two walls. Uh, again, the only ones that will actually utilize that uh, are our employees. That it's, that's the only ones that actually be allowed to it. Uh, we have reviewed. Uh, again, I did provide and tried to work with, uh, with HERC in terms of providing some additional information in, in, uh, relative to the Act of Protection Zone. Uh, a question was regarding the DEP in terms of wellhead protection. I don't know if I know specifically what that is. I, I know I don't, but I do know that they do have a permit from the DEP and associated with the tanks uh, that they have here um, under cover for the tank farm. Again, they, they'd be happy to, uh, to discuss that if, if that's comfortable. Uh, they hadn't proposed that. It wasn't at their existing site, obviously, but if the intent is to get some type of cover over the tank, uh, the, the fuel tank pad, uh, they'd certainly be willing to, uh, to entertain that and install something with that. 110% of the maximum storage volume. Again, I, I, I asked her if she could confirm that for me because I don't know because it's a, it's a double tank system with the interstitial uh, alarms associated with that, uh, which is a little bit different than the actual, you know, uh, secondary containment associated with 110%. So I apologize. I don't have an answer for that. I'm hopeful that uh, if the board, I mean, obviously this is all state of the art. They all have all of, again, all of their uh, state permitting and federal permits associated with it. Uh, they certainly will be working with uh, the fire department in terms of the NFPA codes and all those other types of things. Uh, I think the other one that was here was uh, E1E, which is uh, that everything would be corrosion resistant mm -hmm. and everything, again, is, is state of the art and corrosion resistant and certainly, uh, uh, certainly provide an answer for that. Uh, in terms of disturbance and phasing, I mean, basically uh, uh, everything, the site work is pretty well done. Uh, as Jade stated, uh, we did have originally uh, both of the dumpsters back at this location. This is just basically the separated because we do have a fence now that kind of separates uh, this use from that. Um, so that, you know, just the separation of the dumpster associated with that. Uh, there is
is one proposed light pole that would be fixed on the uh, the island itself, uh, and that will be, you know, it's a 10-foot po pole, and uh, certainly it will be full cut off, and I'll certainly get something from staff on that. Uh, any signage would be uh, building mounted. Um, the area disturbance, again, I'll be happy to put it, but it's pretty much all done. It's completed, uh, and the phasing plan really at this point in time is, you know, phase one is pretty much... Uh, we're trying to get it complete, and phase two will just basically consist of that small building addition, which had been uh, uh, previously approved. So, uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I know it's it's probably. I wish I had some additional information in terms of the uh, uh, you know the actual tanks, be able to provide you some specific information regarding that. Um, I, I did the best I could based upon uh, uh, my limited knowledge. Uh, certainly, like I say, uh, these tanks are not my strong suit. Uh, but like I say, they have got all their permits, local uh, state permits. Uh, they're certainly willing to come in and, and make sure associated with the code enforcement officer and, and the planner and the fire department that uh, uh, everything is up to code and association with that. And I would uh, ask, if possible, that if we could get some type of conditional approval allowing us to work through staff uh, with those items would be most appreciative. Uh, with that, I'd conclude my presentation. Again, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just for the record, we have the opportunity for public comment, but uh, I'm not seeing any interest. We can just turn to the board. I will say, and maybe we can pass down the, we do have a draft motion that's prepared, conditional, for conditional approval. Um, we'll see how board discussion goes and whether folks are comfortable with considering that given some of the new pieces of housekeeping and additional information that, that may be needed. But I uh, figured we'd put that in front of everyone now just so we can reference that as you. And, and just for the board's edification, I understand that they're on Gibson Road, and I think these folks were the opinion chiefs. They're just going to move from Gibson Road down here, but obviously the difference is, you know, they're in the act for protection here where they weren't on Gibson Road. So uh, right. uh, I think that was just something that caught them a little bit by surprise associated with that. But they did go immediately with that to the DEP, like I said, and, you know, made sure that they were all set from a permit standpoint associated with the state regulations in terms of being uh, within that area. Okay. Okay. And I to say you probably know more about this than I. Do you have anything? Uh, this is one of those items where I sit here and say if the staff is happy, then I am happy. So I encourage you to work very closely with staff and their, their needs. Uh, I appreciate <laughs> that. And again, we do. And again, I do feel bad. Uh, uh, like I said, the, uh, the uh, environmental manager uh, for her uh, had every intention to be here with me this evening. And uh, again, the holiday week and something just came up and uh, she couldn't make it. But she did say she'd be back Friday. Uh, into the office at least and provide a lot of additional information or additional information for me that certainly I'll get to staff and certainly we'll get to staff whatever they need to get a, a comfort level associated with uh, meeting the uh, the actual regulations. All right. Roger. Um, I, I would tend to agree with Nick and just looking at the conditions on the um, draft motion I think basically leaving it up to our staff <coughs> and, I think um, you'll see that generally speaking the conditions mirror the, some a lot of the staff comments yes. so the only observation I would make is um it looks like they have actually some of their equipment you know their rental equipment on the site already do you know that? No, I can't answer that. To be honest, I know they, they were certainly working on the building last I was there, and I think they actually I think they had the ballers last yeah. I saw that they were so you know they were getting prepared. I almost for it. thought they might be actually working there. I mean, operating right there. No, I don't think they're actually operating out of the site at this point. If they are, I, I I'm yeah. not familiar with that. But no, I, I I believe they're still working out of the Gibson Road site. Okay, uh, I'm all set. Rick, uh, I just have a, a question. Real quick on, on the map, you have a gravel, you know, you have pavement and you have a gravel area. What's the gravel area for? Am I not, re or am I not reading that right? See, right. Yeah, what's that? I apologize. That should have been taken. That was existing gravel area. Um, it's pavement, though? Yes, I believe that. Okay. I was wondering why I had a big yes, gravel area in the middle again, of the I, I think it was, it, it was existing gravel area before we started doing anything. All right. Before they started doing anything. Uh, other than that, I'd say exactly what Mr. McGee said. And um, as long as Angela's happy, and Jay. And All right. Thank you. Rachel? Yeah, I'm a little conflicted because I, I didn't see the original plan. Uh, I wasn't on the board, so I've been 
trying to figure out the difference between the original one and, and this one, and I think I'm, I think I'm there. I, but, I probably should have brought the original, to be honest with you. Yeah, that, that, that's all, I, all right, I, I think I have it, but I am kind of concerned about the length of the list of the conditions that are put on there, um, some of which, some of these conditions, uh, depending on on how they're they're clarified might make a difference in in whether we wanted more more work done or not. Uh, so, uh, at, at this point, I, I'm not ready to vote on the draft motion. Um, and if it were to come to a vote, I would be likely at this point to vote no. I, I would like to see more of this completed. <clears throat> I'd like to commend staff for picking up on the fact that this is on an, in an aquifer protection overlay. Um, this is very important, and this is why I also agree with Ms. Hendricks in that um, I would, I would, I am not inclined to support a, a motion either, um, largely because <coughs> we can't confirm. Not only because we can't confirm the 110 percent secondary containment, but. Um, I don't know if you folks have looked through the SPCC plan that was here. And um, an SPCC plan is supposed to be uh, renewed by a professional engineer every five years and should also have annual updates. And if it's, you know, just, you know, a thousand gallons here or there, but if you turn to page 2 1, we're talking about an aggregate amount of about 6,000 gallons of, of virgin petroleum. Um, so I am not inclined either to, so if their permits are anything like the SPCC plan, I need more information and am not inclined to support a, a draft motion conditional at this point or otherwise. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is one of those, one of those, uh, tricky cases where, you know, you, the, the, the number and, and nature of the conditions starts to push the envelope somewhat. And um, I, I think, um, you know, Jay and staff are generally always careful to say when, you know, when we, when we do have draft motions with conditions that um, that's not intended to signal that, you know, that that's the expectation, that the, that's the direction the board will necessarily go. And I appreciate that staff um, was, was prepared to, um, or is prepared to um, follow through on, on these conditions. Um, I think the fact that we don't have the um, additional applicant's representative here to speak in a little more detail to some of these environmental items, to me, kind of is what puts it over the top. Um, I don't know that we would necessarily get there if that were the case, given some of the outstanding technical information. But I think that given that we're, you know, we're, we didn't have the opportunity to hear from that person and ask that person questions, um, and I commend Mr. Frank for doing his, his, uh, his best. Um, my personal uh, preference here would be to let this, uh, let this mature a little bit more and, and see if we can get some additional information and hopefully the next time around it's if you know not technically a consent item it's something that that we can consider um, you know in an efficient way and and have all or at least most of the loose ends tied up so uh, I guess to recap I'm not prepared to put a motion forward um, someone else wanted to do that, that would be their prerogative, uh, but that uh, as one member with one vote, that's, uh, that's my, where I am right now. Um, based on what I know as a layperson about where this all stands, given that this was a site that was previously approved by this board, we're only talking about a couple of differences. You know, it shouldn't be a huge lift, but we do, you know, we have the, the fuel tank, you know, Fuel Island is a significant change in the aquifer overlay. So, um, I feel more comfortable just uh, letting this go another round. So, 
that's where I'm. Could I have a quick question, Jay? Are you meeting in three weeks again? Yep. We have yep. one more meeting. December 11th. And again, I appreciate your time, folks. I really do. I mean, obviously, you know, as always, you know, if you're trying to move someone from point A to point B, uh, like I say, they're right up the street on Gibson Road, they're moving down, and, you know, everyone's thinking, Jesus, it's no big deal. This should be pretty straightforward. We already have the site plan approval. Um, but let me see what I can do in terms of, you know, getting you some additional information regarding the fuel and uh, get back in on the 11th. Again, obviously, our issue is just that, you know, uh, these folks <laughs> thought they'd be moving in so sooner rather than uh, but then later. So, uh, uh, but, you know, uh, we'll do a turnaround and we'll get it back to you. All right. Thank you. Can I just add that we about? may want to have make sure that we have an active SPCC plan. Yeah, and again, I appreciate understand yeah. what I they basically gave me the one that yep. and it sounds like it was an older one, unfortunately, from the one that they had on 17 the Gibson years. Road. 17 years. And again, there may have been some uh, appendices with that that I might not have included because uh, it was probably just a very long document. And yeah, uh, that might have been me. I might have just stopped talking at a certain point and said, here you go. <laughs> For the board, for the board's uh, just sort of point of reference, and, and, and um, you know, Sean Frank, I think, came into the project a bit later, but um, staff has been obviously out on the site. Construction has been going on, so we've sort of had a third-party inspector through that process. Going under the, we did a pre-construction meeting talking about the, are we building what was originally approved? Yes, and so that's how this whole project started, and it was at some point this summer that our commercial code inspector was doing some final details. I think it was uh, Mr. Butler, maybe it was you, Angela, who was having the conversation. Either way, someone from staff was having conversation and, you know, it, it sort of just came up in general conversation that, oh, Herc is moving there, bring their fuel containment tanks. Well, well and so that, that's when we sort of said, okay, time to, <laughs> time to have a whole nother discussion because if you're changing one tenant, you know, if it was going to be Cobble Hill trailers and now it becomes, you know, Corey Fellows trailers, well, that's, you know, that's not a big deal. But, you know, it was, when, it was when it was noticed that there was this whole other activity that these conversations began. Well done. So. Okay. I think I'll come back and see you in a few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. <coughs> Again, item number eight was tabled. Uh, item number nine, staff report. Jay? Um, Yep, so our next meeting, it was just referenced, is December 11th. We are not going to be meeting in this room. At this point, we're scheduled to meet over at the high school cafeteria. This room is going to have its uh, audiovisual systems completely redone. It will be shut down for two weeks in December, so we will be over at the high school cafeteria. Um, if, we, if that changes, we'll certainly let people know that, um, but that's the expectation for the next meeting, so we'll be over there. Um, and then in terms of the next meeting, I uh, did have a conversation with the, with the chair and sort of threw out the idea of, as we like to try to do at the end of the year, get together for a, a little planning board workshop slash, slash end of year social gathering, if you will, be, maybe for the next meeting. We'll do a, a light workshop, really, you know, thinking, as I think one of the things I was thinking about, Corey, you just sort of referenced is, you know, how you're getting your staff uh, packets is, you know, is that working for you? Really get back to Dropbox and talk about the electronic files and, and sort of some of those details because we've been sort of, we've initiated and we've let it float for a few years, so probably a good time to figure out what's working for you. What do you need in your hands to make the, inf to make the decisions? Um, so I think that would be um, to do that and, and have a little supper before our meeting. So. Hopefully folks can put that on their calendar and an email will follow as a reminder of that. So that is what I have at this point. Can I add? Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that we're having a public meeting for the Gorham Road Improvement Project and we're looking, focusing on finalizing phase one of that which basically mm. goes from the school campus, Wentworth Drive, down to Maple Avenue. Um, and that is on December 13th at 6.30, and we're holding it at the Scarborough Library. Because, <coughs> again, this is not available. But um, hoping to, to finalize those plans for construction for next year. It's construction <coughs> season. Thank you. Uh, administrative amendment report. Uh, nothing to report this meeting. Any planning board correspondence? 
planning board comments. <clears throat> Um, I will just briefly note that, um, as some uh, expected, there have been some uh, parking challenges at Nonsuch River Brewery. Um, <laughs> they've been very successful, which is great, and um, I've been there one or two times. Um, maybe, Jay, could you um, brief us just uh, quickly on sort of the, the council's recent uh, action? On, and some of you may be aware of it. Sure. Because there was some on-street parking that was happening, speaking of Gorham Road. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Ab absolutely. I'd be happy to bring you up to speed. Um, so let's see. Uh, the Ordinance Committee, um, that sort of, uh, actually it was brought to the Ordinance Committee from our police department uh, that there were some concerns about safety, about on-street parking, uh, particularly in light of some concerns we received from abutters and residents who had driven by. Um, and so looking at that issue, it was brought to the Ordinance Committee, who ultimately brought it forward to Town Council. What did they bring forward, I should probably reference, is um, typically in town, on-street parking is allowed, but for where our ordinance says it's not allowed. And so over the years, as you can imagine, the list is kind of long and, and, and long, well, leave it at that. Um, and so... What the council at this point passed at first reading is to eliminate parking on the, actually on the restaurant side of Gorham Road. And the pr principal concern there was around site distances uh, coming out of the driveway. Other concerns have been around sort of people crossing the street and sort of the, the, the nature of, <clears throat> excuse me, particularly this time of year, it's pretty dark out there. Um, but at this point, um, Council sort of found that parking on the other side of the road, there was more opportunity. Um, it, it didn't conflict with folks' driveways who live next to the restaurant, which is one of the concerns they've heard, and it didn't conflict with site distances. Um, and so that was passed at first reading. Um, and actually, this is an issue that staff is going to be bringing to our transportation committee on November 28th. Um, so what's that, next Tuesday? Tuesday. Next Tuesday to sort of talk about some more of those details um, and try to make some, uh, help the council make some recommendations if they, um, if they so desire. Um, so that's where that stands right now. Um, so that what, what's, and then sort of just to close the loop, what council has standing before them is it would uh, limit parking to the, um, uh, let's, let's call it that south side of Gorham Road um, only, or let me put it this way, it would, um, <clears throat> uh, it would call for no parking basically from about the pump station more or less mm -hmm. up to eight corners on the north side of the street or on the restaurant side of the street and park on street parking would be allowed as it always has been elsewhere um, yeah and just to reiterate as most of you will recall that the um the applicant in that case did not get any special relief in terms of parking. They met the parking requirements. Um, and I, I know that I'm generally not one to want to require extra parking, an extra impervious surface. You know, sometimes it's just tough to gauge how things are going to play out and whether it's something that's kind of an initial blitz because the business just opened. We've definitely seen that happen in other cases, and then it sort of calms down based on everything I'm aware of. The owner's been, you know, operating in good faith and cooperative and so we'll just have to see how it all unfolds and we certainly want them to be successful but um, appreciate that update. I'll quickly add to that if we're talking to the ordinance or whispering into their ears the ordinance committee it is a good time to review the number of spaces we require for a restaurant pub type of facility just because I think we're seeing it most everywhere. I mean the parking right was cure is packed um, the Mexican place would appear El Rayo. El Rayo. Uh, their parking lot's jammed a lot of the time. I have no doubts that the one that's going to be going in off of Route 1 on the Gateway Commons. Gateway Commons, that's the residential. Uh, the table and tap. Table and yeah, tap. Yeah, that Duncan's called Duncan's. Yeah, Duncan's. Yeah. Yeah. The table and tap, they're going to have an issue with it. Um, and, and whether it's just moving it up by a half a spot and, you know, a point five or something just to give us a little breathing room on top of the parking being tight there. Where are they going to put snow? I mean, this is, that's when the real fun's going to start down there, just so you know. Um, <laughs> you know, having an extra half a spot um, for that type of facility here in Scarborough isn't going to hurt us. Uh, it's just another spot to put snow if they don't use it. Thanks. If we're whispering into people's ears. Thanks. Thank 
Thanks. I think Anything else? Can I make a just quick comment? I think the, um, that lighting is very important too, and we always talk about that. But I don't. I drive that road very often, a couple times a day, and that gets dark at four or five o'clock now, and that a very dark corner. Mm -hmm. You know, you get someone coming out of a black truck, stepping out into the road. Well, I don't <coughs> like it. It's hard to see them. Yeah. So, just. To, yeah, like lighting is. I know they're looking at all that, be, but yeah. it'd be nice whenever we do a establishment like that if we can anticipate. I know they're changing the may be changing the parking rules a little bit, but if we can anticipate that overflow and make sure it's at least well lit, so you can. I think these are all all things that fall within making sure that things really work when we have this, especially this sort of TVC type approach where we're, we're trying to encourage somewhat denser development and more activity in certain areas, sometimes you know, adjacent to some residential areas. So I think it's good that we're, everyone's kind of tracking it and really refining things going forward. So. All right, Cor, yes. just to Jay, do you recall when they, uh, on their parking there, did they have the standard width parking spaces, or were they now? Uh, no, they were the standard 9 by 18 spaces. Any other planning board comments? I'll move to adjourn. Second. All in favor. Thank you. There's uh, two plan two. Uh,